Hello and welcome to Weird Wild World, a weekly series that takes a look at the power of nature. From natural disasters to rare and strange phenomena and everything in between, we will take a look at the wonder and weirdness of our planet. I'm the Illuminati and today we're going to be exploring yet another fascinating fact about nature that I found particularly interesting and relating to all of these volcano topics that apparently I'm just going a whole ham into, lahars. So lahars are essentially liquid concrete rivers that follow volcanic explosions. So now that you got the gist of what we're talking about, let's dive right into it. So a lahar, to put it simply, is mud that flows down from slopes of volcanoes. A lahar is an Indonesian term, however, and these concrete rivers, as they're often referred to, can be found around stratovolcanoes all over the world. The reason why lahars almost always occur by these kinds of volcanoes in particular is because stratovolcanoes tend to erupt explosively and their tall, steep cones are either snow-covered, topped with a crater lake, constructed of easily eroded rock debris, or internally weakened. Lahars are common under these conditions because, well, think of them as a volcano landslide. Tall, steep cones and rocks are going to make them all the more dangerous. Although it may be known as a volcanic mud flow, lahars can vary in temperature and they don't actually need a volcanic eruption to occur, which is something I didn't actually know. One source states, eruptions may trigger lahars by melting snow and ice, such as the snow and ice you may find on top of a volcano, or by ejecting water from a crater lake. Pyroclastic flows can generate lahars when extremely hot flowing rock debris erodes, mixes with and melts snow and ice as it travels rapidly down steep slopes. Lahars can also be found when high volume or long duration rainfall occurs during or after an eruption. On steep slopes, rainwater can easily erode and transport fine grained, loose volcanic sediment and form a slurry, especially if vegetation has not had time to grow back on recent volcanic deposits. Some of the largest lahars begin as landslides of wet, hydrothermically altered rock on the steep flanks of volcanoes. These types of collapse and resilient lahars are natural events during a stratovolcano's life history and can occur long after it stops erupting. Lake breakout floods that occur without an eruption can also lead to lahars. They commonly occur after a stream becomes blocked by a volcanic landslide or pyroclastic flow that forms a natural dam. The most frequent cause of lake breakout is the overflow of water across a newly formed natural dam, followed by rapid erosion of those loose rock debris. By further erosion and entertainment of sediment and water, the initial flood can transform into a slurry and increase in volume as it races down valley. Although when you think of the word debris, you might think of normal rocks, the boulders that these lahars can carry can be the size of a car. One source states that 60 to 90% of lahars weight can come from rock debris and considering that lahars can reach speeds of 40 miles an hour, well, it's no wonder lahars are such a concern. Let alone the fact that these volcanic gases create acidic groundwater contributing to the rock's breakdown, making them more likely to be carried away. Lahars vary, of course. Some may move slowly and be less than a few meters wide, but others can be hundreds of meters wide, tens of meters deep, and flow several tens of meters per second. If that's the case, then there's no outrunning them. Although a lahar will eventually decrease in size the further it gets from a volcano, even communities residing some distance away from a volcano itself may not be safe from lahars. When there's heavy rainfall and the chance of a lahar increases substantially, evacuation is the only option. Sheltering in buildings won't help as lahars can knock them over and flood them. Moving to higher ground and escaping is the only way to be sure to avoid a lahar completely. According to another source, Because lava flows can completely block roads and highways that may serve as the only evacuation route for people threatened by an advancing flow, it is vital for communities that could be inundated with lava to develop emergency response plans. One of the chief threats of lava flows to property owners is that the flows may burn buildings and homes even if the flow doesn't reach the structure. Houses can catch fire from the intense heat of an advancing flow. Now it's time to get into some real world examples. 
Historically, the most deadly volcano landslide occurred in 1792 when sliding debris from Mount Mayuyama near Unzen Volcano in Japan slammed into the Ariaka Sea and generated a wave on the opposite side that killed nearly 15,000 people. In this case, there was a volcanic eruption the same year. Mount Unzen actually consists of a group of composite volcanoes located on Japan's Shimabara Peninsula. After the initial eruption, this large earthquake was triggered from the Mayuyama Peak, a 4,000 year old lava dome. This landslide is what caused the tsunami and many deaths and the scar from the Mayuyama landslide remains visible to this day. Unfortunately, this is not the only time Mount Unzen caused devastation. Even in the 1792 eruption, it was the worst. In 1991, Mount Unzen erupted and this caused the first large-scale pyroclastic flow, killing 43 people in the evacuation zone, including French volcanologists Maurice and Katia Kraft. Husband and wife team who pioneered the filming and photography of active volcanoes. According to Volcano Discovery, in 1991, Unzen woke up from its 200 year slumber and started to extrude a new lava dome at the summit. The eruption quickly intensified and in June, repeated collapses of the new lava dome generated pyroclastic flows that swept down its slopes at high speeds as high as 200 kilometers per hour. The largest flow occurred on June 3rd, 1991. A pyroclastic flow is different from a lahar, but they're similar in the sense that they both flow from a volcano and well, destroy everything in their path. According to National Geographic, a pyroclastic flow is a dense, fast moving flow of solidified lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot gas. It occurs as part of certain volcanic eruptions. A pyroclastic flow is extremely hot, burning anything in its path. It may move at speeds as high as 200 meters a second. Pyroclastic flows form in various ways. A common cause is when the column of ash, lava, and gases expelled from a volcano during an eruption loses its upward momentum and falls back to the ground. Another cause is when volcanic material expelled during an explosion immediately begins moving down the sides of the volcano. Pyroclastic flows can also form when a lava dome or lava flow become too steep and collapses. Pyroclastic flows often occur in two parts. Along the ground, lava and pieces of rock flow downhill. Above this, a thick cloud of ash forms over a fast moving flow. Such a flow can transform the landscape drastically in a short period of time. Not only does it destroy living material in its path, but it often leaves behind a deep layer of solidified lava and thick ash. Pyroclastic flows may result in flooding as streams are blocked or rerouted by the flow. Floods may also occur when the flow of hot material melts snow and ice, swelling rivers and streams beyond their banks. A mud flow containing volcanic material called a lehar may also form when the rock of the pyroclastic flow mixes with water to become a quickly moving slurry. So just to clarify, these are two completely different things, but a pyroclastic flow can make a lahar far worse, so I thought it was worth mentioning. Thankfully, because of how dangerous Unzen had proved to be, the Unzen Scientific Drilling Project, or USDP, has been created to better understand the, quote, growth history, subsurface structure, and magma ascending mechanism of Unzen Volcano, end quote. I was able to download the results of this test, which will be in my sources if you wanna take a look. According to the drilling operation, the magma conduit, especially its upper part, is believed to be the site of effective degassing. And that is the major factor controlling eruptive styles. Although it's not as if we can change the volcano or keep lava or lahars from flowing down it, at least we can better understand it. And then more can be done to prevent these types of catastrophes. Despite this, it wasn't until 1985 when lahars fully gained worldwide attention. According to one source, the Pacific Northwest Seismic Network, this was due to the Nevado del Ruiz eruption. The lahar proceeded in three major pulses. One of the lahars virtually erased Amero. Three quarters of its 28,700 inhabitants were killed. The first lahar was 30 meters, 100 feet deep, moved at 12 meters per second and lasted 10 to 20 minutes. Traveling at about six meters, 20 feet per second, the second lahar lasted for 30 minutes and was followed by smaller pulses. 
a third major pulse brought the lahar's overall duration to roughly two hours. By that point, 85% of our marrow was enveloped in mud. Pierce County has mapped and installed signs for volcano eruption routes in case of lahars, a warning system triggered by sensors on the mountain near the Carbon and Palyup River channels will activate sirens to warn residents downstream. As we mentioned, there doesn't need to be an eruption in order to create a lahar. In this case, according to the sources, the eruption was relatively small and yet more than 20,000 people died. The tragedy became South America's worst and globally the fourth worst volcanic disaster, as some would say, and it could have been easily avoided as well. One source claims the event caused heated debate because government officials chose to ignore volcanologist warnings of an advancing lahar. And the eruption itself had been preceded by seismic activity for a year. This isn't completely accurate. The government didn't ignore warnings, but unfortunately there was a communication breakdown, which I'll explain further in just a moment. But let me reiterate, this wiped out over 70% of a town's residents. Though the numbers may be different from source to source, it's always been at least 20,000 people. In this case, the lahar occurred because the eruption melted snow and ice from a glacier capping the volcano. This isn't the only time the volcano Ruiz has caused devastation either. Ruiz did kill over 1,000 people when lahars flooded the upper valley in 1845. Though 1845 may have been 140 years prior, it's not as if lahars were an inconceivable notion in the area. Lahars were known to be dangerous there and they absolutely need to be taken seriously. On the other hand, Earth Magazine says that emergency planning did not begin in early 1985. It's not as if nothing was done, but simply wasn't enough. Geothermal researchers visited the summit in January, but in February, the region's only seismograph broke. The Colombian Institute of Geology and Mining did request another, and the USGS, Costa Rica, and Swiss Disaster Relief Corps and Swiss Seismological Service all sent equipment. The USGS Deputy Chief for Latin America wrote in a note to the United Nations Disaster Relief Organization, the opportunity is clear and it is unfortunate that we can spare no one from the Hawaii or Cascades observatories. If the volcano is to blow, let us hope that both we and the Colombians are prepared. On September 11th, 1985, Ruiz blew gas and steam in a ferric or water-related eruption for seven hours, but no magmatic eruption occurred. It was only then that a response plan was developed. Then two months later, on November 13th, 1985, Ruiz sent up steam and gas in another eruption. Then the rain began and six hours later, the magmatic eruption started. It only took an hour after the eruption began for the first lahar to reach the closest town. On the night of the deadly eruption, everything should have been in place to evacuate. Before leaving in September, Martinelli, a seismologist from the Swiss Seismological Service, commented that he was convinced that everything would be done to limit the possible damage. The Lahars killed tens of thousands, destroyed 50 schools, two hospitals, and more than 5,000 homes. Even if the Lahar was bound to destroy these buildings, how did the evacuations fail so spectacularly? Volcano emergency management is not easy, Marzo, a geologist with USGS says. It takes communication and trust among scientists, local residents, and government officials. In the case of Ruiz, it almost worked perfectly, says Marzo, until it didn't. In the aftermath, researchers realized that one of the biggest problems was that Armero and the towns nearest the volcano were without power, so communication broke down. The scientists had no ability to alert the townspeople to evacuate. With two hours and 21 minutes between the eruption and the first lahar reaching Armero, the town could have been evacuated if communication systems worked. In the wake of the tragedy, two agencies, the US Geological Survey and the US Agency for International Development's Office of US Foreign Disaster Assistance came together to launch the International Volcano Disaster Assistance Program, VDAP, to track and monitor the world's 1,550 potentially active volcanoes. Since its inception 30 years ago, VDAP has aided in more than 30 international crises, including the 2007 eruption of Nevado del Julia in Colombia, during which 4,000 people were safely evacuated. 
Ruiz is an absolutely seminal event in modern volcanology by virtue of demonstrating the hazards of long reaching lahars from snow and ice clad volcanoes, said Jeffrey Marzo, a geologist with USGS and VDAP team member who was sent to Colombia the days after the eruption. We know now, he said, that a relatively small eruption on a high snow and ice clad volcano can produce lahars that threaten populations tens of kilometers away. Now, Ruiz is one of the most monitored volcanoes in the world. It's tragic that it took such a massive loss of life for lahars to be taken more seriously, but at least as science develops, we can better understand how to stop them. Indonesian volcanoes have been on high alert for lahars in recent years. In 2010, mud flowing down the sides of Mount Merapi triggered by heavy rains reached steeps of 60 miles an hour. Indonesia alone is home to 129 active volcanoes, the two most active being Mount Merapi and Mount Kelut. Though Merapi has a violent history and 1300 people were killed in 1930, there were only two deaths from an eruption in 2006. Any volcanic death is tragic, and I do hope we can obviously get the number to zero, but I'm relieved that things appear to be improving. Almost 1 million USD or 9 million RP has been spent on examining the peak of Merapi using an optical remote sensor technology called LIDAR. The area is also continuing to construct dams and other supporting facilities. Lahar floods have still destroyed hundreds of homes and hectares of fields, but the people in the area of Mount Merapi seem to be on high alert. One article states, the other Indonesian volcano making news is Karangtang, but unlike Merapi, this volcano is actually erupting. Explosions and pyroclastic flows from Karangtang have prompted the evacuation of over 1200 people so far, and the activity has damaged a number of buildings near the volcano. There are some stories talking about 40 people being trapped on the volcano by two rivers of lava. Images of the activity clearing show pyroclastic flows, likely generated by collapsing dome material being extruded at the summit. The status alert is at red, the highest level. A more recent source states that lava did effuse from the volcano in 2019 and that an eruption plume has recently been observed rising. The alert level as of writing this sits at two on a scale of one to four. Hopefully the government continues to fund this research because at the moment, it seems like it's only a matter of time before the lahars arrive again. Thankfully, though they may sound completely unstoppable, there are some things that can be done to stop lahars. There's options such as retention basins, alternate channels, tunnels, and concrete structures. The best method naturally is a warning system and an evacuation plan, but at least these preventative measures can hopefully lessen the damage. Annual evacuation drills are also a fantastic preventative measure, such as the ones that take place in Washington state. In 2019, the city of Orting successfully gathered 3000 students, staff, and volunteers to high ground. Knowing evacuation routes are important, even if hopefully we don't have to use them. But with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's little short episode of Weird Wild World. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, make sure you're liking, subscribing, and following so that you can stay up to date on all the latest episodes. And if you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure to go to my Linktree link in my description box, and you'll be able to see all of my social media and other projects that I'm involved in. With that being said, thank you again, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.